Right. Hello, my name is Charlie. This is a seminar on opening half strategy. Uh, it's not overly complex and it's nothing groundbreaking, but hopefully it's useful if you haven't done a huge amount of creativity. Uh, so, four things I want to cover. Firstly, what differentiates the opening half from 3v3? This is just going to be some basic things that I want you to keep in mind for the next more specific steps of the seminar. Next, uh, what to think about during prep, then specifically looking at PM and LO speeches, and then deputy speeches. I'll spend more time on deputy than on PM and LO, because I think those are more different from the stuff that you already know than PM and LOs. Okay, firstly, some things to keep in mind. The first thing that, biggest difference I guess from BP is that you have two closing teams, and both closing teams are actively trying to beat you, even though one of them is on the same bench as you. And the goal here is not just to win the opening half, but to win the entire debate including both of those two teams. So many of the biggest strategy mistakes that come during opening half and BP stem from the fact that you treat opening half like a 3v3 debate and ignore the fact that two closing teams exist and are going to try and engage in the debate in a way that locks you out. Secondly, the judges suck. Uh, and that comes with an apology to anybody who judges a lot in the room. But it's not really their fault. BP judging is hard and it's confusing and there's a lot going on, which means that it's just more difficult to understand the arguments that are run and the way those arguments interplay with each other than it is in 3v3. That's why you get way more accurate calls in 3v3 than you do in BP. There's just a lot more that can go wrong. And the consequence of the takeaway that you should have from that is that you, in response, need to accept that as a fact and make your arguments simpler and easier to understand. The best BP speakers are ones that have huge amounts of clarity uh, and lots of people do much better in BP than they do in 3v3 because they have a lot more clarity than their competitors. Next, you have a lot less time in prep. That means you need to work much faster when coming up with ideas and also when writing your speech. And finally, your speech is shorter and you have to take a POI. So in 3v3, you have eight minutes to give your speech. In BP, you have seven, probably 30 seconds to 45 seconds of that is taken up by letting someone ask a POI for 15 seconds and then giving a response to that for probably another 20 to 30 seconds which means the actual amount of speaking time that you have in BP is extraordinarily small, and you need to do as much as you can with that limited amount of time. Okay, these are just some basic thoughts, but I want you to keep thinking about them for the rest of the presentation when we go through the more specific stuff. All right, let's start with what to think about in prep. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about here is timing, and I'll start with the timing that I think is a good idea if you haven't done very much BP uh, at all. So I think at first, if you're still working under being used to having 30 minutes worth of prep in Australs, or like 45 minutes worth of prep if you were in high school, keep the silent brainstorm under five minutes. You just don't have as much time as you're used to to write your speech. And if you're still writing things out, not word for word, obviously, but in more words than the average BP speaker does, it'll probably take you longer to write your speech than 10 minutes, which means it's worth starting writing early. Get your leader, if that's you or if that's your teammate, to start writing very soon after that. I think it's worthwhile having a discussion about your overall strategy and your overall case, but I don't think it's worthwhile allowing both members of the team to fully flesh out every thought that they've had in their brainstorm immediately afterwards, especially if you aren't used to writing speeches very quickly, because you'll find that prep quickly devolves and you don't have enough time to actually write your arguments out in full. Uh, so once you've had that brief discussion, I think you should immediately start writing your speech. And then as you start writing your speech, you can start integrating your teammates' thoughts as you're writing it out. Don't let them ramble and then start writing out your speech. I think it's also a good idea when you're delivering your thoughts to your teammate to remember that prep is really time scarce and that your teammate might not be used to writing arguments out quickly. So you should try and, within that brainstorm, figure out how you intend to explain this to your teammate and how you can do it in a way that's concise and easy. Once you get better at BP and you become quicker at writing, I think you can massively extend, expand the amount of brainstorming that you do. Some of the best BP debaters, people who debate worlds, spend half of prep in that brainstorm just thinking of ideas uh, and spend a lot more time discussing strategy than that and can write their speech in less than five minutes. So I guess that's kind of a goalpost to work towards. Next, how to not get tucked by your own closing. I think it's good to keep a mental checklist of common ways that closing teams tend to outdo their opening. And there are a bunch of really, like, they're kind of dumb and they don't always work, and teams often say they're doing them when they're not actually doing them. But it's good to think about them as a mental checklist of stuff that you haven't missed. 
So the first is, I think, taking on a higher burden. So that's when your closing team says, well, our opening has kind of squirreled the debate a little bit. They've avoided the hard parts of engaging in the issue. Maybe they haven't met the other opening team at the full extent of the burden that they wanted to take. So they just decide voluntarily to take on a higher burden that is necessary. And then they beat their opening team because in taking on a higher burden, they've advanced the position of that bench greater. Or in the event that you've lost the opening half, they've managed to beat the other opening where you didn't. So sometimes in 3v3, it's strategic to keep the burden as low as possible because you want to make the debate easy for yourself. Doing that in opening half often means that you beat the other opening team but lose to both closing teams because they've had the time to understand either how they can explain why your attempt to lower the burden is incorrect or just choose to engage in a debate at a higher burden and then both closing teams have managed to supersede both opening teams because they've engaged in a higher level debate than the opening half has. Next proving something analytically prior. Teams often say this when they aren't actually proving something that's analytically prior, and something that's analytically prior doesn't actually mean that you auto win the debate. But judges, like I said, kind of suck in BP. Lots of them will hear that an argument is analytically prior and therefore say your closing has beaten you. So sometimes it's good to think about the debate in terms of like analytical chronological order and at least run the first argument in that sequence so that your closing doesn't take it and explain it for you. Common things that fall under that category of something that's analytically prior is proving that something is going to be done well. So if you have a debate that's a policy motion where you're implementing something, it's often insufficient to just explain that that thing is good, but also that the best version of that thing is implemented. Because even if it isn't necessary to win the debate, because a bad version of that policy is still a good thing, your closing team can massively expand the set of impacts that you're able to access by explaining not just that a bad version of this is good, but the very best version of that policy is gonna get implemented. And that expands their impacts and will come over top of you. Other stuff like proving the counterfactual. So in regret debates, obviously you have to prove what would have happened instead of the thing that did happen. One mistake that opening teams often make is running the set of obvious arguments that explain why the counterfactual that is intuitive is a good thing, but that has an analytical gap where you need to explain why that counterfactual is actually the counterfactual that would likely have occurred. Or maybe you choose a counterfactual that is unambitious and your closing is able to come up on top of you because they prove a counterfactual that is, that is better than yours is or, or explain it in a way that's more nuanced. Other stuff that closings tend to do is run things like vertical extensions. So that's just where you haven't fully fleshed out the full set of mechanisms that are available to your team, and so your closing team is able to run a set of extra mechanisms that come over top of that. So the thing to think about then when you're running arguments is, even if you're not trying to horizontally cover the entire debate, remember that within the arguments you do run, proving something to sufficiency is really important, but also often going beyond that and making sure you exhaust the set of vertical extensions that is available to your closing is also good. Uh, other things that closings like to do is run what I've called misc fake bozo arguments that have high impacts. And what I mean by that is, Sometimes in BP, it doesn't really, judges don't really care that much about the level of proof that arguments have behind them. And the reason for that is partly because of the reduced time that teams have, but also just because there isn't that much rebuttal done in BP because teams are more focused on building their own arguments. And that means you can get away with sketchy arguments that are creative and have huge impacts, but you kind of don't believe are real. Those are arguments that you might want to burn in leader or deputy just for the sake of preventing your closing from running those arguments because they appear to have higher impact than yours. So try and burn all of those kinds of extension ideas when you're at opening. Because it's easy at closing to think, okay, this is a set of obvious arguments. What kind of creative things can I come up with in this 15 minutes of prep to supersede my opening is probably going to run. Forgetting to do that as well at opening just leaves those options available to your closing. And you should be doing that in prep, not just during the debate when you're listening to the POIs that your closing asks or the ideas that your other opening team has come up with. All right, and then next, so aside from that mental checklist, here are some general thoughts on what good argumentation in BP is. I think the two big headlines that you should think about when you're coming up with your case is firstly, you want your arguments to be big, and secondly, you want your arguments to be sticky. So what do I mean by big? The team that wins in BP isn't always, but is often the team that has the biggest impact in the debate, right? Whereas in 3v3, I think it values a lot more the teams that best prove their impacts. The scale of impacts is super important in BP. That means the other teams are also mainly focusing, oh, sorry. And the reason for that is other teams are also mainly focusing on building big impacts 
and doing rebuttal isn't as helpful in BP, so you can get away with running those sketchy proofs and, and fake arguments that I mentioned before. So BP values really big arguments. And the one thing teams do a lot of is weighing rather than rebuttal, which means that if you want to win on the metric that BP debates often get judged on, it's not going to be, it often isn't the case that metric is, well, this set of rebuttal engaged with this set of argument, which do I think is still left standing in the debate? That is sometimes the case. But often, there are sets of arguments that are resilient and stand the entire debate, but at the end, it comes down to which on weighing is more important. So it's important to explain in detail within your arguments and to come up with arguments that have huge impacts, not just ones that you think you can, you can prove. I think BP doesn't validate or doesn't uh, prioritize humility in the same way that 3v3 does. You want to be ambitious in the scale of arguments that you run, rather than just going for something that you think you are able to prove and that is going to be a different debate. Second thing that I think is important in BP then is having sticky arguments. The reason for that is a BP debate is very long and everyone who speaks after you has an incentive to make your content <coughs> sound irrelevant. Which means that each closing team and the team on the other half of the bench is going to try and engage in a debate that's often different from the type of the way that you saw the debate running out. They're going to make it sound like their arguments are the real meat of the debate, that your arguments were off clash, that you didn't fully understand the debate properly, you didn't take on a high enough burden, etc. What you want your arguments to do is still seem important at the end of the debate, even though three other teams have created their own arguments and attempted to engage the debate in a way that locks you out. The best opening cases are the ones that are still being talked about at the end of the debate, and if you are off clash or don't engage in the meat of the debate, your arguments will become irrelevant and you will probably lose. So keep those two things in mind when you're coming up with your arguments in prep. Which arguments of the set that I've come up with have the biggest impacts? Which of them seem the stickiest? What's likely to still be talked about at the end of the debate? What's super relevant? What meets the crux of the debate? What's the adjudicator going to think is, is still relevant? And then, once you've agreed on the set of arguments that you think the biggest impacts are the stickiest, think, well, when I'm fleshing out this argument in prep, how can I explain it in a way that makes it big? And how can I explain it in a way that makes it sticky? I'll talk more about the specific ways of making arguments sticky when I go through PM and LS features. Okay, so now let's talk specifically about uh, PM and LS features. So firstly, in terms of how to structure your speech, this is a very basic rundown and you absolutely shouldn't be compelled to follow this set of timestamps. I think firstly, keep your introduction short, some people have like a minute long introductions. I think introductions are good and important, but I don't think they should be necessarily as long as you would permit yourself to do in 3v3. Next, finish your setup quickly. I think, I think there's probably more than the average debater does. Lots of setup is just a badly framed argument. Uh, that is, you can probably move a bunch of the stuff that you were trying to prove and set up within an argument, either because it's not actually that relevant to both of your arguments, it's only ever relevant to one of them, or just because the thing that you're saying as setup is actually just an assertion that you needed to prove, and therefore you should probably slot it into your arguments as like a conclusion of the mechanisms in your argument because it was contingent on those mechanisms in the first place. However, there are lots of debaters who do lots of setup, and when they run setup, they run it almost as an argument, and that can be extremely successful. I think the best example of this is Ollie Cummins and Dan Yim's debates at Madrid Worlds and the lead up to Madrid Worlds. That was a team that often did like six minutes of setup in Ollie's speech and then capitalized on that setup in Dan's deputy speeches. And that was successful firstly because they were able to backload lots of con content as a result of that, which led to throwing off a lot of other teams, but also just meant that they had an extremely sticky contribution to the debate because everything that followed on from their set of arguments was almost contingent on the way that they had set up the debate in Ollie's speech which then meant they were able to come on top of a lot of very messy debates. So find a balance between the two. Some debates justify huge amounts of setup and you can do that strategy, but I think a lot of the time, err on the side of less setup and try and flesh out your arguments well given you have less time. Uh, also, at the end of this setup, the useful thing you can do in BP is ask for a point of clarification, and that's especially useful if it's a messy debate. Points of clarification I also think are quite useful for getting closing teams to explain their extensions. Uh, because they reveal the conception of the debate that the closing team had going into prep, which is useful for you and your deputy speaker in figuring out how it is that they intend on engaging the debate and adapting to that. I also think it makes your setup sound more reasonable and charitable if you're willing to engage with other teams 
on the terms that you've set the debate up in within your speech rather than waiting for them to do it in their speech. Okay, once you've done that, run the first argument. I think you can make the first argument longer than your second argument. Obviously, it's, your second argument is garbage. And at the conclusion of your first argument, consider taking a POI. One of the bigger mistakes uh, in terms of timing and you know keeping the like, train of thought going that first time BP debaters have is they take the first POI that's asked to them when it's asked to them, or they take it immediately at the conclusion of protected time which often throws you off because it's unrelated to the content that you're currently discussing and you kind of have to jump out of the train of thought of the argument you're discussing into responsive mode to respond to the POI that's been asked to you. Remember that you get to pick when you take a POI, you can wave down POIs that are asked before you're ready for them. So think about where in your speech are you gonna take a POI. Generally speaking, I think the best place is between your first and second arguments. It allows you to defend the argument you've just explained after you've already proved it, if someone's got a point about that. And if someone's got a POI that's irrelevant to the rest of your, your speech, it means it isn't blocking a train of thought that you're right in the middle of processing. After that, obviously run your second argument and then wrap it up by 7.15. Okay, final bit on PM and LO speeches then uh, is important things to think about during your speech. So like I said, the most important thing in BP is making your argument sound big and sticky. So firstly, that means explaining in detail why your arguments are going to be the most important in the debate. And that means being dramatic and grandiose about your impacts. Like I said, 3v3 often rewards teams that are humble, but BP does not. I also think some light and shade never hurt anyone. Try and engage in some rhetoric, make your arguments sound cool. As much as it's a bit excessive sometimes, making your arguments sound cool and engaging in good rhetoric means that you're remembered at the end of the debate. And even though I think in 3v3, often you can get away with like gatling gun, getting out your case as quick as possible. In BP, that kind of stuff is actually important because there is a real risk that you haven't left that much of an impression on the judge. And then at the conclusion of the debate, another team's arguments sound more important because they were explained better. The reason why EPL extensions happen, EPL extensions are like where an ESL team is at opening and they explain their arguments with an accent the judge doesn't understand or in a way the judge finds unpersuasive. And then the closing team runs the same set of arguments, but in an EPL accent, in a way the judge thinks is more persuasive. The reason why those work is a product of this, that judges are dismissive of arguments that don't sound as interesting, that don't sound as good. And a lot of the times the reason why a closing team is able to get away with being derivative is because they explained things in ways that sounded more nuanced, that sounded more engaging, that sounded bigger in impact, but were actually just the same arguments that you ran. So I think BP, more so than 3v3, actually does put a level of importance on rhetoric. Uh, and finally, uh, I think within doing this, uh, engaging in rebuttal isn't really that important at all. So getting your case out should be your primary goal and ensuring that that case sticks there for the rest of the debate even if you are LO and you've already heard the PM speech. And the reason for that is because BB, BP, if you think about it, it's sort of like each team has to build up their tower of, of arguments. And at the end of the debate, the team that wins is the one who's built the biggest tower, right? If you'd spend time in your PM speech trying to knock down the tower of your opposite opening team, you pull down their tower, but the other towers in the debate haven't been affected by your rebuttal against them means the effectiveness, if you think about the race towards the top of building the biggest tower of argumentation, the effectiveness of engaging in rebuttal against your opening team, especially if that rebuttal is specific and line by line, is only one third as effective as building up your own argumentation. Because it's effective in the direct comparison between you and your opposite opening team, but it isn't effective in getting around the two closing teams that are going to come after you. So the absolute priority at PM and LO is building your tower as high as it possibly can go, making sure your arguments are sticky and relevant and are gonna stay there. Next, I also think there's some important things to think about in terms of making life easy for your deputy speaker. So I think that whilst you should focus still on, on proving stuff and getting the case out there and you should trust your deputy speaker to engage in weighing and do this sort of explanation, I think it's good to try and engage in a little bit of analysis about why your arguments are likely to be the closing arguments that will probably come out and the and will outweigh the arguments that are going to come out uh, 
from the op bench so that your deputy speaker doesn't have to do all of this weighing or all of this analysis. Like I said, this isn't your primary goal, so don't focus on it in its entirety, but it's often useful to hedge your bets and make sure that at some point for at least a minute or so in your PM speech, at the conclusion of your arguments, you're explaining why this argument is analytically important to the overarching side of government or opposition bench, why this set of arguments is more persuasive or outweighs the set of arguments that are intuitive on the opposition bench, etc. All that stuff you should integrate into your speech and be doing at PM and LO at least a little bit, even if it's not your primary goal. Okay, next, this is gonna be a bit longer. Uh, I'm gonna explain some thoughts. Deputy speeches, this will be more in depth, partly because I know more about speaking deputy because I've done it more, uh, but also because I think this is a lot more different to 3v3. Speaking deputy is a lot different to speaking second for a set of pretty clear reasons. You don't have a third speaker, which means there is no one to clean up for you and do weighing. You can't just obliterate the other team's case and then have someone come after you, after you and clean up the scraps and make things look neat again. You also have a huge greater number of considerations to think about with both closing teams coming after you and also having to win the open path. So I'll split this up into three goals, the three uh, roles that a deputy speaker has. Firstly, winning the opening half. Secondly, locking out your closing team. And thirdly, beating the other closing team. So, uh, firstly, how to win the opening half. Here are some things that often win the opening half, but you shouldn't do anyway. The first is engaging in a race to the bottom with your burden. This is sometimes very strategic in 3v3 because it makes it a bit much easier to win if you explain why the burden pushed by your opposition is unreasonable. However, it will often lose you debates in VP. Your closing will swoop in and beat the op bench on their own metric by taking on a higher burden than their opening. This happens all the time. It's one of the most common reasons why closing teams win. It's one of the most common forms of extensions, as I said when I was talking about what you should think about in prep. Don't engage in this kind of analysis. I think burden pushing is an interesting and good part of debating, and you should engage in it a little bit. You shouldn't allow your opposition to have an excessively high burden for your team but try and be more charitable than you would in 3v3 in terms of being willing to operate or accept the debate at a higher burden. And then explain that you have done that in order to prevent your closing team from running these kinds of extensions. Because even if it wins you the opening half, it makes you vulnerable to the closing half engaging in a different debate that supersedes the opening. Next, I think the other important thing that you should distinguish this type of speech from compared to 3v3 is getting stuck doing line by line rebuttal. Some speakers are super excellent at line by line rebuttal. I think probably the best line by line speaker who still does line by line rebuttal in VP with really excellent effect to huge amounts of success is Sophie Sheed. You can Google any of her speeches recorded from Belgrade, uh, Madrid or Krabi Australs. It can be done. You can do line by line rebuttal extremely efficiently and you can explain why that line by line rebuttal is important to the rest of the debate. But I just think it's way harder for the average novice to do lots of line by line rebuttal in BP and still be successful with timing and still manage to engage in the debate holistically and to still do things like weighing and to not get beaten by your closing teams. Often engaging in line by line rebuttal means you get stuck in the opening half clash and just results in you forgetting that the rest of the debate is gonna play out after you. So I think the more successful thing to do is rather than engaging in line by line rebuttal, Try and think about the arguments that are being run holistically. How can you respond to all the mechanisms that have been given in one swoop, whether that be by realizing that many of them are interconnected or by trying to analyze a point of weakness that all of the mechanisms have so you can address that point of weakness in rebuttal, whether that be the way those mechanisms are framed or a piece of characterization that those mechanisms are contingent on. Try and think of ways that you can respond to the argument as a whole rather than the individual mechanisms because you're unlikely to have time to get through all of them and also do the other set of stuff that you need to do. And spending that time engaging in that line by line rebuttal probably won't be worth it because it will beat your opening but won't beat the two closing teams. Stuff that you should do to win the opening half. Firstly, the type of rebuttal that does have a positive contribution is when you flip arguments, right? So where I said before that when you do rebuttal, you're you know, pulling down your other team's tower, but the rest of the debate's towers are still staying at the same height, so it's only one third that's effective. 
The instance where that isn't true is where you're able to explain why a line of argumentation run by your opposition actually works for your side. Sometimes your opposition will give you an idea for an argument for your side that runs along the same lines as their argument or uses similar logic as their argument but proves a positive contribution. I think the important thing to do when you're engaging in this kind of rebuttal is to recognize that you're doing it and explicitly point out what you're doing to your adjudicator. Because many adjudicators have in their mind the conception that rebuttal only affects the debate in the direct comparison between the team giving the rebuttal and the team who is being rebutted. But rebuttal doesn't always do that. In this instance, what you need to say is, well, this set of rebuttal flips this argument and provides a positive contribution for my bench and also gets us up more over the closing team's arguments that they're going to run in future. So explaining explicitly the way that your rebuttal functions in relation to the dynamics of BP makes your rebuttal more effective and, and stops you from suffering from that thing that I was talking about before. Next, uh, I think as opposed to doing rebuttal at all, it's sometimes important just to engage in lots of weighing. Sometimes the only thing you need to do to beat an argument is to just outweigh it with your own. This is kind of cheap debating, but I think BP values cheap debating quite a lot. So if you think you can just outweigh an argument and eat the harm, it is perfectly reasonable to do so, uh, and probably strategic to get an argument out of the way. Uh, next, uh, I think probably the other most important thing that you want to do a deputy to win the opening half is defend your case. So whenever I give deputy speeches, I tend to have uh, two parts to my speech. The first is defending our case and explaining why it's the most important. And the second is uh, rebutting the other opening team's case, right? Within that first part, you wanna make sure that all the rebuttal or the implicit rebuttal that your other opening has done gets engaged with to ensure that your case is still there. Because if the other team starts trying to pull down the tower that you've built up, that then has consequences potentially for the next two closing teams that come in. So it's really important that you as deputy do a bunch of rebuilding work to try and ensure that your argument is as strong and resilient as possible. The other important thing to do is to build in lots of preemption. Because when I talked about PM and LO speeches, I mentioned that at leader of opposition, you actually probably shouldn't bother doing very much rebuttal. Which means that you're speaking deputy prime minister, you haven't seen the kinds of rebuttal that your other opening team is going to do. And that means you need to preempt that rebuttal by thinking about the line of argumentation that that team has run in their case, how that argumentation implicitly engages with your arguments, and therefore the types of responses that the deputy leader of opposition is likely to run in response to your case. And that will help your case be resilient against your opening team and have the added effect of helping you when your closing teams then come into the debate. Okay, next section, how to lock out your closing. Uh, the first thing that can be beneficial is to explain why your arguments come analytically prior to other aspects of the debate. I think it's important that you only do this when these arguments actually do come analytically prior. Lots of speakers drop these buzzwords when they're incorrect and that makes you look stupid. You need to actually explain why it is analytically prior and why it is important that that argument is analytically prior. So I have an example here. So in the debate, this house believes that the right to assisted suicide should be given to all adults of sound mind. You could run an argument proving that governments and medical systems are capable of rigorously determining consent and ensuring that an adult is in fact of sound mind. You then don't just need to point out that that argument is analytically prior to other things. You need to explain why it comes analytically prior. So that's firstly, because it preempts or comes before many of the arguments the opposition is likely to run. For example, it proves uh, that people should be given this right regardless if other people's subjective met metrics suggest that they should continue living, right? So if an opposition team runs a set of arguments that says, well, I don't think being chronically ill or in chronic pain justifies committing assisted suicide, if you can prove that the adult consents, is of sound mind, and is making a rational decision, then any argument which assesses a subjective metric of quality of life and suggests that, well, therefore this decision is invalid, has been preempted before that even started because you explained why none of that matters because it isn't your subjective opinion about who should opt into this process, it's this person's subjective opinion about their own experience which they understand best. But next, 
it's also principally necessary in order for other gov benefits to be assessed. So maybe you could point out that your closing could potentially run a set of arguments that proves uh, a greater set of benefits than you did in terms of what this gives people who opt in to assisted suicide, the types of pain that it relieves, etc. However, even if they are capable of proving those impacts, accessing those impacts requ requires you to principally justify permitting people to engage in this choice, which requires you to prove that people can make rational and accurate assessments of their suffering to decide if that necessitates assisted suicide. So you need to engage in that more in-depth explanation about these arguments. And the thing I would note about that set of analysis is it isn't prompted by anything that's happened in the debate, right? Like after your prime minister has run that argument, you're not giving that set of analysis as rebuttal to something your other opening team has said. You need to, of your own volition, recognize that there are a set of arguments your closing team could run, and then think of a way to explain why the set of argumentation you've already won, run should supersede those arguments. And you need to get good at prompting yourself to engage in this because it's insufficient to expect your other opening to be the team that prompts you to engage in analysis at a high level. You need to do it before other teams do that because you won't get the opportunity to do it after your two speeches have ended and you've realized that your closing is running an extension that you could have preemptively outweighed, but you haven't. Okay. The next thing you can do a deputy to help block out your open closing uh, is to run new pieces of sex substantive. So this is called turf burning and it's a very valid and effective strategy in BP. It's just where you run as many arguments as possible and as you can think of in order to burn those arguments so that your closing can't run them as well. So anything that you think of during the debate or after your leader's speech or in response to the argument that the opening team, other opening team has run, you can choose to incorporate into your deputy speech and that contribution to your bench is just as important in engaging in any kind of rebuttal. Because a positive contribution to your bench advances your bench as much as rebuttal takes away from the other bench. So don't think about it as wasted time. Think about it as building on the set of impacts that your team can take credit for in the debate and that the adjudicator is going to consider. Sometimes you don't even really need to flesh out these arguments properly. It just stops your closing team from running them. And when you're thinking about what new arguments to run, listen to any of your closing POIs and see if they leak what their extension is going to be before actually having run. Okay, next, try to preemptively outweigh your closing team. I think it's good to dedicate one to two minutes of your speech to explaining why your team's impact is likely to be the biggest in the debate. You can do this after you have finished defending your case against uh, the other opening team's rebuttal. So like I said, uh, I tend in my deputy speeches to de dedicate the first half of my speech to defending the case and then explaining why it outweighs the other teams because I, I actually just don't think rebuttal is, is that important in BP, certainly not as important as building up your own case and making that case resilient. So dedicating a lot of time to weighing is super important. Weighing against arguments that haven't even been run yet is worthwhile even if you think it risks you know, prompting your closing to run that set of arguments. They probably won't have time to do it in, in the time frame that they have, so it's useful to just do that weighing. All right. Finally then, let's talk about how to beat the other closing team. So the first thing that you should do is listen carefully to their POIs and try to preempt the arguments that they're gonna run. Uh, the example that I'm gonna give here is my Madrid world's often. So the topic was, this house prefers a focus on societal factors, e.g. socioeconomic factors, as opposed to individual factors, e.g. personal history, when addressing the causes and consequences of mental health. I was, OO in this debate, Gov member asked a POI to Sam Trotter, who was my LO, and the POI essentially went, if you blame mental health issues on people's personal histories, surely they are less, surely less people end up seeking treatment in the first place because they don't want to blame themselves or their parents. I listened to that POI and listened to Sam's response and go, oh, Sam's response is pretty good. We've dealt with that, it's fine. <coughs> it then becomes the entire closing government extension and I ignore it entirely in my deputy speech, and then the two closing teams, Oxford B and Sydney B, progress, and we don't. What that illustrates is preemption is really important in BP, and there's lots of clues you can be listening out for to do that preemption better. Don't make those kinds of silly mistakes. It'll definitely happen to you at some point. Learn from the mistakes when they happen and figure out how to get around them better. Next, uh, continue to focus on making your arguments as big and sticky as possible. 
So try and think about new ways of impacting your arguments or explaining why they're important. It is just as important to outweigh the other closing team as it is to outweigh your own closing team. So just like I said, you should dedicate a lot of time to explaining why your argument is more important than other arguments on your own bench. You should also do that for the set of arguments that are likely to come out from opposition. So what you should be doing is explaining why the clash your arguments are engaging in represents the meat of the debate. So don't let the closing half make you sound irrelevant. And my final tip then, in terms of beating the other closing, is to try and avoid, as much as possible, getting sucked in by a bad opposite opening team. So obviously there are three teams in the debate that you're competing with, and in a statistically significant number of time, uh, amount of the time, that other opposite opening team is going to be your least big threat in the debate, which means your greater consideration should be the better arguments that your closing teams in the debate are likely to run. What you should do is listen to that opposite opening team, recognize when they are running a stupid set of arguments, when they've clearly missed the debate, when they've missed an obvious argument, and don't expect that to be a free pass. Expect the closing opposition team to take that argument and run with it. Which means even if you think you've gotten away of dodging a bullet, you should still try and defend yourself against that attack for when it probably inevitably comes from that other team. And, like I said before, you need to get good at prompting yourself to engage in this kind of discussion. Debates are pretty stressful, and it's super easy to just see the opening half clash going on, and literally entirely forget that there is going to be a closing half clash. So, think actively about, at every step, what the closing team is going to do, recognize when there are a set of better arguments that are going to be run, and dedicate time in your deputy speech to giving explicit preemptive rebuttal to that set of arguments. The best example that I can think of, uh, of this uh, is the 2016 Fest Worlds Grand Final, which I think illustrates this pretty well. The opening government, uh, the topic is just that, uh, I think the wording is that the world's poor would be justified in having a Marxist revolution. I think everyone has seen Bo's Prime Minister speech, but I think uh, Finelli's DPM is actually what wins in the debate. And the reason for that is because the other opening team, who's actually a Sydney team, I don't think does a very good job. But the closing opposition team, I think successfully proves that that Marxist revolution would go extremely badly for everyone involved. And I think what Finelli realizes in his DPM speech is that it is very possible that a closing opposition team is going to run and prove that argument. So he dedicates a huge amount of time in his DPM speech hedging against that argument being proven by explaining why, even if unsuccessful, we would still call that revolution justified. In the same way that someone defending themselves against being attacked, even if they failed, would still have been justified in engaging in that self-defense. And reframing the arguments that Bo has already run through that lens of self-defense <coughs> and explaining why the wording of the topic using the word justified means that even if that self-defense is unsuccessful, even if it ultimately ends up worse than the position you were in before, you would still describe that act or that attempt as having been justified, is the reason why closing opposition, rather controversially, doesn't end up winning the debate. So I think it's good, if you want to engage in debating at a high level, to start trying to think of where you can engage in that kind of preemptive argumentation. All right, in conclusion, Firstly, remember opening half is not the same as 3v3, it has some very extensive differences. Secondly, be as efficient as possible, remember your timing constraints in prep and in your speeches. Thirdly, do not forget that the closing teams exist. Think about them at every stage, prompt yourself to engage with them because your other opening won't necessarily prompt you to engage with the best version of the opposition bench. And finally, remember that in BP, the most important thing for your arguments to be is big and sticky, not just true. All right, that's all. Thanks very much. Um, I'll get the draw set up, everyone, for this talk. Oh.